The reason that they preach prosperity is because you have to have money to, to win souls. No, you don't. You do. No, you don't. Name name one person that's won a million souls that didn't have a, a large amount of money. Jesus. I understand what you're saying. We don't need the necessity of the money. It's not right. need. But if you do have the money, you can win more souls with money. You can turn $20 million into 50 million souls. But she can turn $20 million into 50 million souls. Jonathan Shuttlesworth, in my opinion, is the best that there is in, in the U.S. The, the hand of God's on his life right now. Let me ask you this. Does this man have a private jet? Yeah. So, so. Why? So that he can do more for God. Why does he need it? Okay, who... Let me ask... No, 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 I'm, just, I'm just asking. No, no, let me flip it. Who should have Who should have the private jet? $250,000 to play with it for one You think Jesus had $250,000 in his pocket? So today, if he was alive today, he would, it would require $250,000 for him to go and do everything that he did one, for one year. Brother, it literally like, what, like, brother, like directly I'm what? asking where in Jesus' life and his ministry was he as prosperous as Jonathan Shuttleworth where he had a mass amount of financial support like not just financial support I'm talking about wealth like supernatural wealth like he was wealthy like a Kenneth Copeland or like a Jonathan Shuttleworth or like a, a Joel Olstein where in scripture does it say that he had that much money and with his disciples Now today, I want to share a conversation I had with two young men who follow a pastor named Jonathan Shuttlesworth. Jonathan is a disciple of the well-known prosperity teacher, Robert Howard Brown, better known as the Holy Ghost bartender. Drink, 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 drink. Drink, 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 more, 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 drink, drink. I think, oh, do bore the esta pacalia do, oh, le beve di abasho do pre. In a man bad no book all on bone chamber. I'm plum of hunger on my head. I'm a stage cap. Pull bum in a my hip. Plum of dog so bold. Where were you sitting? Over there. Yeah. Right here. Give the fake pump fire. Woo! Pump shot pot of dust shot. Yeah, that's it. Hey! Hey! What? Sit up! Sit up! Get her up! Get her up! Fire! Fire! Get him, Jesus! Fire. Now before we dive in, I want to make something very clear. This video isn't about dragging anyone's name through the mud, but rather the goal here is to highlight the dangerous heretical teachings of the Word of Faith movement, or what many of you might know as the Prosperity Gospel. Now personally, I don't even like calling it a gospel at all because it's not a gospel at all, but rather there's a message that destroys the scripture by promising wealth, health, and success as a sign of faith, when in reality, the Bible calls us to a life of surrender, or sometimes even suffering for the sake of Christ. And although we spoke for over an hour, I believe the Lord has planted seeds within their hearts. So stick around until the end, and let me know your thoughts and comments throughout the video. Hey, Rodney, have you heard of Rodney Howard Brown? No. He has a church down in Tampa Bay, Florida, and he's won like 60 million souls for Jesus. So how does he know that? He counts. What's the evidence? You know what I mean? Like with these altar calls, I mean, how many people you see go to an altar call and then nothing changes in their life, and it's like a feel good moment? All you can do is preach those hearts. Yeah. I don't know that you can't control. You know, 
you know what I mean? That's the that's what I have a problem with is saying that someone saved just because they made a profession. You know how I many people make profession? The Bible says, you know to Jesus saying in Matthew 7, he said, many would come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, haven't we done all these things? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You work of iniquity because you never did the Father's will. Yeah. That's I'm not, you have to work out when you're pastoring people. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that, I'm not saying 60 million people didn't get saved, but what I have a problem with is that so many people give out these false gospels or they give out these false Conversions and they just they just count the number. And, um, I don't I don't know Jonathan Sutterworth like wholeheartedly. Like I've seen a couple of his stuff, um, and I'm not going to speak bad about him. But what I'm going to say that when I see people focus more on the the benefits of God rather than God Himself, because people think you have a prosperous life if you don't have sickness, if you don't have or if you have a wealth of money or anything, you know what I mean? People think God has hands on your life, but the real treasure in Scripture is Matthew 6. He said, when you go in your closet and you pray in secret, he says, then you'll be rewarded. What's that reward? It's him. He's a reward. But when I say that, I mean to take a step back and I have to really evaluate what you're saying to see whether if it's in the truth or not. You know what I mean? Because you got all these countless souls out here who are hurting. You know what I mean? They hang on like you ever, I don't know if you ever preached to somebody before, but they hang on to the word that comes out of the priest's mouth because you're to them or the closest thing to God in their life that at that time. So everything that you right. So they hold on to every single word that you're saying. That's why it's very crucial to make sure that you actually you speak in the truth because it is a scary thing to fall into the hands of the living God if you say something that's not his word. And that, and that's there's just a lot of warning in the scripture. I'm like, yeah. I don't want nothing to do with that. I said, I'd rather be, honestly, I'd rather be broke and not prosperous at all and then come out and share the gospel with people. I'd rather do that versus them have everything because I don't want to forget who God is. The thing about him is he's got, he's a third generation preacher. They, they've all lived here before God. His dad was, was broke. He would, he would make a hundred dollars a week as an evangelist, mm -hmm. preaching at churches. So that's five thousand dollars a year, and uh, I think if, if sure. he had fifty thousand dollars in medical expenses for both of their kids when they were born, a Catholic carpentry surgery, and so he was he was broke, dude. John mm -hmm. was broke. He didn't. He never bought a house. He never bought a mortgage. He, he was broke for the first fifteen years of his ministry, and then God supernaturally started blessing him and launching him right now. His uncle Ted Shovelsworth Senior didn't have a home for the first four years that they were that he was an evangelist. So these are people that that have incredible character. For sure. You know what I mean? I know you're not shot, shooting that down the curtain, but what I'm saying is is uh, they have like years and years and years of fruit mm -hmm. of like success. His dad has gone to 65 countries for the gospel preaching crusades. You know? The reason that they preach prosperity is because you have to have money to, to win souls. No, you don't. You do. No, you don't. Name name one person that's won a million souls that didn't have a, a large amount of money coming in. Jesus. He just had money coming in his ministry. No, oh, Lord. He did. He had, he had wealthy women that were following around ministry. Yeah, it's in the Bible. It says that there were women that would go around. They were rich. These women were rich? Yeah, they were. Bro, they didn't have anything. Nobody... The women that followed him were rich. There were wealthy people that supported his ministry. That was the case. And what, what was Judas stealing out of their... Out of I mean, yeah, I mean, they made money. It's not like they didn't make money, but would I say that they're wealthy? What was Judas stealing? I mean, because I mean, you think think about the people who were following around. He had prostitutes. He had fishermen. Like whenever they were excited just to see maybe about two hundred fish in a in a net. You know, what I mean, they these people didn't have much, but what they did have, even they had the they had the gospel. Even when uh when uh, who was it? Was it Peter who walked past the the homeless man and he was like, "So I don't I don't got, it. Yeah. but what I do got is the gospel." You don't need money to share the gospel with somebody. All you need to live. You need water. For sure. But he says, God uh, brings bread and water. He brings. For sure. Amen. He so takes care of the necessities. The There's not the resistance. But what I'm saying is this, though, is that if I reach, even if I don't reach 50,000 people, if I reach one person with the gospel message, that person will go tell another person. That person will go tell another person. Word of mouth. That person will start to begin to live a life 
after God's heart. I understand what you're saying. You don't need the necessity of the money. It's not right. need. But if you do have the money, you can win more souls with money. Yes. Oh, man, you get in a bigger domain. She can turn $20 million into 50 million souls. And she can turn $20 million into 50 million souls. She can turn $20 million into 50 million souls. Now, I want to point this out. Because I think this is a very important note to point out. And the point is this, that people come to Christ solely through the work of the Holy Spirit, not through financial means. In the book of John, chapter 6, 44, it reads, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So that's just one of the scriptures that shows you that it doesn't matter how much money you have, it is the Father who draws these people in through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I have to say this as well. Salvation is entirely a result of God's grace and the Spirit's conviction in a person's heart, not something that can be achieved or influenced by human resources. Again, money has no power to save souls. It is the Holy Spirit who draws these people to come to Christ and leads them to repentance and faith in the book of John chapter 16 verses 8 it talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and it reads as the following and when he has come he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment so that's just one of many false teachings that these prosperity pastors preaches but nevertheless, let's continue on with the video. Show me in the scriptures where God says, if you believe in me, then I'm going to spiritually enrich your life with financial wealth. You go read Deuteronomy 28, the curse of the law is lacked in sickness. But it says in Galatians 3, it says that, Christ, that, that in Christ you receive the blessing of Abraham, the curse of the law of the dog. That's the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham is the blessing that the blessing is power, right? God's blessing. What are you saying? Galatians 3? Galatians 3. Okay. We read the scriptures and you can go look it up. No, for sure. I just want to see what you're talking about. Yeah. Isn't it 313? Yeah. Uh, 313. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, curses everyone that is on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come sure. upon the Gentiles in, in Christ Jesus, that we yeah. might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What is that blessing that he's talking about? He's talking about the, he's talking about the covenant blessing that God made with Abraham. Right, which is what? Which caused him to, to be supernaturally strong and useful to bear children and increase him substantially to make him a nation. What's the, what's the actual blessing, though? Nope. It's God. It's not man from this blessing that he's talking. What is the blessing of Abraham that it might come? That we might the blessing is God's supernatural power. So it was God supernaturally gracing. That was the blessing. So that. And then after that, he became extremely wealthy. We go back to Genesis. You got to start in the beginning, right? Like, I'll be around. Right? He says, I will bless those who bless you, and, cur and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How should they be blessed? With what? What did Abraham have? Who is Abraham to us? He is God. Right. He is a father of what? Faith. Faith. Right. Faith in who? Faith in God. That is the blessing. That we. In the case, then how come after he blessed him, he became extraordinary? He did. He did. That. That. I'm, no. That is. But the real. No. Go ahead. But the real blessing. Again, brother, the real blessing is having faith in Christ. The whole scripture, Jesus said, all the scripture is all about him, right? Right? Yeah. Jesus said that all the scripture is about me. Jesus came to save people to grant their people life so that they can have faith in him. Abraham is our father, is our forefather who started with him in faith. Right? Before the yeah. promise ever came, he believed God and God considered him righteous and a friend. That is the same blessing that we get to receive as well when we put our faith in Christ Jesus. The other stuff, it happens, and sometimes it doesn't happen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. What I'm saying is that the world blessing, it's not the other benefits. The world blessing is us being able to be saved by grace. It's a blessing to be to have faith in Christ. 
That's the royal blessing. You're, you're calling a blessing something you like receive. A blessing is a power from God. The blessing is. Are you telling me grace is not a or receiving salvation grace. is not a blessing? Grace is a power from God. Oh, God, break it down as a definition. Yeah, yeah. If you broke down grace to its core, it's yeah, God empowering. Mercy is God pardoning. Are you telling me? Are you telling me it's not a blessing to receive salvation? You're, you're calling it a blessing as like the receiving of it. A you are receiving it. Like and the power. God so power. are you saying salvation is not a? It's God not a blessing. He saved. He, he gave you the power of the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. He gave you the power to, to live holy. It's if Amen. you live on fire for God and all and for God, then you're going to go to heaven. If you live for him, you're going to go to hell. You're sure. So it's well. What do you? So you saying it's not a blessing? It's all the same blessing. It's all the same covenant. So in the covenant that you have, the covenant of the blood of Jesus, right? That's united you. This is that He's reconciled us by the blood, right? Out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life, right? The blood is the is the thing. Yet without the shedding of blood, there's no permission. Mm -hmm. Right, but but a covenant is cut. The word covenant is talking about cutting, mm -hmm. right? So he cut a covenant with Abraham by blood, the blood of an animal, right, to establish an eternal covenant that never fades. And then he added to that covenant with the blood of, with the blood of Jesus. So he had the blessing of Abraham, but then the covenant of Jesus included eternal salvation. But he didn't get rid of the old covenant. The, the old covenant is still there. So it's the covenant. It's all just the same covenant. And the blood of Jesus is the thing that ratifies it, that, that gets you, grasps you into the covenant. Now, what he just said was not correct. Claiming that the old covenant was never done away with and that the new covenant was simply added. But Hebrews 8.13 clearly states that the old covenant became obsolete as the new covenant was established through Jesus. Now Jesus himself fulfilled the old covenant according to Matthew 5.17. Completing his role and pointing to the new. Hebrews 8.6 also says that the new covenant is better because it brings true salvation and forgiveness. The new covenant does not add to the old. It replaces it offering a new relationship with God through faith in Christ Jesus. And this new covenant isn't about receiving financial blessings. It's about receiving eternal life, being pardoned from the punishment we rightfully deserve because of our own sin. But by God's grace, we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast according to Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 9. Amen? Let's continue on. I disagree with that statement just because of the fact that the blessing, it is a blessing to be able to have faith in Christ. But here's the thing, you when you read Galatians 3 just now, you didn't even like read what it, it said. It literally said the curse of the law has been abolished. You didn't mm -hmm. go over here and read Amen. what the law says. The curse of the law is literally wow, like it's literally pop. If you read no, the like, curse of the law, if you read it, this no, for sure. Yeah. If you read the curse of the law, it's sickness and pop. He says that he got rid of it. There you go, brother. No, 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 I will. Yeah. I will. This is a real curse. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. The curse is sin. The curse is not just... I think, I believe, I believe... No, sin does bring... Sin does bring sickness. And you know, there's, we live in a, it brings a whole bunch of things. For sure. But I talked to a rich man last week. This man, if you ever watch the channel, this man said, I don't have debt. He's an ex-MLB baseball player. Yeah. He said, I don't have any debt. I'm a good man. I like he's like, I'm about to leave this conversation, go talk to go have a room full of three hookers. He's I'm about yeah, he's crazy. Um he's I don't have I got all I got everything I need. Yeah. But the thing that he's lacking, he got spiritual debt. Yeah. He got a debt to God. You may have the, everything you like. Jesus said, What were the profit of man if he were to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? If he were to gain everything you have, but do not have Christ. You will profit nothing, so the scripture says. So, what sin truly, what the curse truly is, it's the curse of the law. The law, without the law, we wouldn't know what sin is. The real curse is us being in sin. That's what Jesus came to set free. Jesus didn't come to put money in your pocket. Jesus came to set you free to make you alive.
Yeah. You know what I mean? The other stuff, it's a blessing. But the real blessing is him making you alive, turning, making dead man become alive. But that gentleman said, he's like, we gotta be good. He just ain't coming to make bad people good. He just came here to make dead people alive, man. That's his, that was his mission. This, so everyone who the father, who the father had given him, that he would lose money. He would bring them to life. The, the victory message it takes you out of all that stuff. What's the victory message? It's the word of faith. It's that, that this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith, that you can live free from sin, that you can live free from sickness, that, that God will prosper you so that you can win more souls. It's the victory message. Is God, hold on, wait, what do you mean? You never got sick since you became a believer in Christ, since you started believing that you never got sick no one time? Not since, since I put my faith in like the heat and healing, that Christ took stripes on my back, I don't really get sick. What is the stripes that he's taking off of you now? That's the question. What is the stress that he's taking off of you? Don't focus so much on the, on the physical world, man. That's spiritual. He cares more about the spiritual side than the physical side first. The stripes that he's when, I, when he's talking about the stripes that he he bore. Hey, sorry, brother, how you doing, man? Whatever he's talking about, he's he bore the stripes on the, on his back. Refer back to the gospel, what he did on the cross. He took the stripes away from us, so we don't have to deal with this. So he dealt with it for us. That's a real stripes that he took away so that we can be healed. Healed of what? Spiritual poverty. So that we can have a relationship with Christ. The problem with that is that's not the context of what the Bible says about you. It says that he took stripes on his back so he could be made whole. The Bible says in Matthew 8, it says they brought to him all that were sick, Amen. all that had demons. Amen. Yeah, he, yeah, he did all those what things. He, he cast them out and he healed them. Amen. So he healed all of them. Amen. And it says he did this to fulfill Isaiah 53. Amen. It says he took up our infirmities and he bore our diseases. Amen. So Isaiah 53 says that Jesus would heal your physical diseases. Amen. As Matthew 8 says that he healed all their physical diseases. He's talking about physical sickness. First Peter 2 said, quotes that, and he says he took stripes on his back so he could be made whole, quoting Isaiah 53. So they're all talking about physical What happened in Isaiah 53? What else According happened? To Matthew, Matthew says that that verse is talking about this. Let's talk about the whole context. What happened in Isaiah 53? But if you, it, if you don't have to talk about the context. He says, wow. he quotes it. He says he healed all of them physically sick. Amen. And then he quotes the verse, literally telling you what it means. He gives you the interpretation. What happened in Isaiah 53, though? What did he do? What did it say? That, you know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. It goes back to the work on the cross. That's Again, that's part of the covenant. There was one part right? Here's the here's the thing. What what happens? This I'm just as consecrated as you, 100. For sure. Like, but but the thing is, is it, what if everything I'm telling you is true? And what if the Bible says that? And then you get to heaven, and then you and then you didn't you didn't fulfill your assignment because God sent you somebody to tell you about it, but you didn't. You didn't well, the assignment that I'm fulfilling, it's already fulfilled. It's not fulfilled till you're done on earth. For sure, but the assignment that I'm fulfilling is belief in Christ. My main ministry, this is my main ministry. My main ministry is being a husband and being a father. And then this, that's my main ministry. That's what I'm fulfilling. And it's the first believe in Christ, what he's done for me. Then being a husband, from that understanding. And then be a good father to my children and then raise them. Then this. Yeah. So that's my ministry that he has given me. Then he has given to every other believer who is a man to have a who's a, who a man after God's heart. Yep. That's so Isaiah fifty three says go to verse ten. Oh man, you can start in the beginning, but it says it got, the real thing is that surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, that he has seen and stricken, smitten by God and afflicted bit but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our... That's talking about physical healing. He was bruised for our iniquities. What's our iniquities? What is iniquity? Yeah, it's, it's like the nature of the devil. It's sin. It's sin. Okay. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. We have, like sheep, have gone astray, and we have turned away to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, the sin of all of us on him. So that same verse you just quoted, it's misquoted out of context. I know he's God to... To, to, to lay upon him the sin of everyone, the punishment that we deserve, and please God to do that. So it's not talking about a physical healing. I don't do this out of ill will, but it's because it's important because there's so many believers like that, with that mindset, saying that it's all about that. 
And I'm not trying to point you out, but even with that same teaching that you just tried to say, you just misquote the scripture. I didn't misquote anything. You know what I mean? You saying it's talking about the physical healing when the whole context. You still haven't opened the Matthew. Oh well, in a second. I just yeah, want to listen. You know what I mean? The whole. They look they look like they look like it just talked about everything which she didn't talk about. It talked only about him coming to heal people of sin. That is what happened in Matthew is Isaiah 53. So I just want to point that out to make sure we're on the same page so that you understand that. There's a big misunderstanding about these scriptures, leading me to believe that those who think this way don't really understand the gospel and are really following a false gospel. The young man said Jesus' sacrifice was meant to make us rich, healthy, and free from sickness, but that's not what the Bible teaches. He uses Matthew 8 and 1 Peter chapter 2, which referred to Isaiah 53, to support his claim. But when we look at these passages closely, it's clear that they talk about Jesus' sacrifice to save us from God's anger, not about guaranteeing us wealth or perfect health. Now, when we read from Matthew 8, starting in verse 16, it goes as the following. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now, this passage of scripture shows us that Jesus is healing people and also is fulfilling prophecy. But the main point is his authority to deal with sin, not to promise health or wealth. Likewise, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 22, it says, Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth? Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return? When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins and his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Again, even this passage shows us that Jesus is suffering as an example for our spiritual healing and for righteousness sake, not for physical health or material blessings. This is why the prosperity gospel gets this wrong and is very dangerous. Jesus' sacrifice was about dealing with sin and offering eternal life, not about material wealth. Amen? Let's continue. Of money. Let me ask you this. Does this man have a private jet? Yeah, 100%. Why? So that he can do more for God. Why does he need it? Okay, who? Let me. Ask, I'm, I'm just. I'm just asking. Uh, let me flip it. Who should have? Who should have the private jet? Does it, does, why does he need a private jet yeah, to preach the gospel? Does he need the private jet to preach the gospel? Yes. But let's let's get beside this. Let me ask you. This. Who should have the private jet? Well, it doesn't matter. Who should? I'm asking for. A, I'm not. I'm not. Talking, we're not. Just, well, we're not just talking about anybody. I answered. Your we're question. talking about. I believe, I believe that it that it helps his ministry. So let me ask. Answer my question. What you believe? Who should have the private jet? Well, well, I'm talking more so. We can, we can like, no, 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 no. I don't know. That's good. That's good. We're talking more so what First Timothy chapter 3 says, what a man of God, who a man of God should be. Because, I mean, that's the standard. It's not the standard of, like, who should have a private jet or not. But what does the scripture say what a man of God should be? A man of prayer, a man of after God's heart, a man of ministry, the preacher. What should his life be like? Do you think... That God needs you to have a private jet to go share the gospel. You don't think God has missionaries in other countries? You don't think God has saved other people outside of here to go share the gospel in their own local area? Because the problem is, like, we may not, we may all see, like, oh, okay, yeah, he wants to use that for ministry. But you really think an unbeliever are going to do that? In Ezekiel 36, he says, the people around you, he says, I'm not saving you because of you. I'm saving you because of my name's sake, because the people around here blaspheme my name because how you're living your life. What's the difference from riding in a commercial airplane? Why do you need a private jet? You see how funny it looks? Here's what's funny is it was given to 
Nope. For sure. So, so God gave it to him. Gave him a private For sure. God's blessed everybody. Just like every other. God doesn't seem to care. Just like every other prosperity teacher. I mean, like, let me ask you this. Jesus said, let me ask you real quick, real quick. Jesus said, he said, the, the, the student is no better than the teacher. Why didn't Christ have a life like of prosperity? Why didn't he have a life? He did. He did it. They, they, were, they were gambling for his clothing. Who was gambling for his clothing? Soldiers. The soldiers. We ain't talking about the soldiers. We're talking about his disciples. We're talking about his ministry. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, not the Romans. Jesus Christ. So they gambled for Jesus. Jesus' clothes. While he was hanging on the cross, yes. Yeah. So, so why what I'm saying for something that was a rag. Because they thought it was funny that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. And then they crucified him because of that. They let a murderer go because this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. He claimed to be God in the flesh. So that's why they did that. So I'm asking. 38. It says that anything that you give up for me or for the gospel's sake in this life, you will not be able to receive a hundredfold in this life. It says amidst persecutions and then in the next life, eternal life. So everything that you've been saying, except minus the part of, of receiving all this stuff from God, he says you'll receive a hundredfold. You'll receive persecution, and you'll receive eternal life. Brother, literally, like, what, like, brother, like directly. I'm asking, where in Jesus' life and his ministry was he as prosperous as Jonathan Shuttleworth, where he had immense amount of financial support? Like, not just financial support. I'm talking about wealth, like wealth, like super wealth, supernatural wealth. Can you show me that in scripture? He traveled around without a job for three years and, Where at? and funded 12 people right. in their ministry. Where at? All of them. Funded their food. How much would that take? Let's, let's, let's do that. How I many were their jobs? You think they saw fishing? They, they, yeah, they saw fishing. They, they traveled around for three years. These guys were still fishing, bro. They were still like, even Paul, he says, I don't take anything from anything else. He said, even Paul had his own job and he was building tents with the other, with the other apostles. So maybe it's just like, maybe my brain doesn't work. See here. So I'm in, I'm in so this conversation. So this is two hundred fifty thousand dollars is what it would take for one. <laughs> you think year. Jesus had two hundred fifty thousand dollars in his pocket? So today, if he was alive today, he would it would require two hundred fifty thousand dollars for him to go and do everything that he did in one, for one year. Where in his life, where in his ministry, where he was as prosperous as you're saying that he was, was he supernaturally wealthy in the sense that he had an immense amount of money? Like he was wealthy like a Kenneth Copeland or like a Jonathan Shuttleworth or like a, a Joel Olstein. Where in scripture does it say that he had that much money and with his disciples? Because the only thing his disciples got was apart from it, I believe... If they had those things, it would destroy the gospel message. I believe the gospel message will be destroyed because they would have not be able to do the things that they were able to do if they had that type of life that you're saying that they had. Because, I mean, historically speaking, these men gained nothing, nothing but death torture and hatred and persecution they didn't have no money to gain because most people would die most people would die won't die for something that they know is a lie but most people would die for something they know to be to be true and they'd be willing to give up everything what changed them they seen christ go into the tomb and then three days later they seen him right before him outside the tomb that, the resurrection changed them yeah they didn't gain anything from it but death so if you're saying that they were as prosperous as you're saying, they could have just bought the way out. They could have just done all these other things and bought the way out. No, they didn't. These men died torturous deaths. So when I see that lifestyle in comparison with scriptures, two different things, brother. No, it's not. It is. In closing, the prosperity teachings are very dangerous because they lead people away from the real hope and joy found in Christ, replacing it with false promises of wealth and health. Now the Bible warns us about preaching a false gospel. In Galatians 1, verses 8-9, through 9, it says, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, 
let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. This warns us that preaching a different gospel has serious consequences. Now the true gospel is that Jesus came to deal with sin by offering his life as a perfect sacrifice on the cross. He died, he was buried, and then he rose again three days later, giving us a chance to repent and to believe in him so that we can receive forgiveness and eternal life. And after you come to faith in the Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 reminds us that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. For those who don't understand, I want to be the first to tell you that we are richly blessed with spiritual treasures that far exceed any material wealth. Why? Because the scripture says that the Lord is our inheritance. So with all that being said, let's stay focused on the real message of the gospel. Let's seek God's kingdom first, trust in his provision, and find our ultimate satisfaction in our relationship with Jesus Christ alone. Amen? If you enjoyed this video and it helped you draw closer to Christ, please like, comment, and share it with others. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you can stay up to date on the latest videos. Thank you for watching and may God bless you. Peace.